And the first thing that I will look at will be regression objectives. I'll go quickly through that. This, these are things that I'm sure you know. But it is just to re recall that multiple regression, I, actually, why I talk about regression, it's because it will be the, the first element of calculation that we will do tomorrow in canonical analysis. The first thing that we will compute will be multiple regression for all the, uh, the species in the response matrix. So in multiple regression, we can use it for description. And the aim then is to find the best functional relationship among the variables in the model. In multiple regression, we have one response variable and a lot of explanatory variables. And in my notation, the response variable is called small y. And the explanatory variables, they are called x. And they can be, for instance, environmental variables. Tomorrow, we will do the same thing, but with having a whole matrix of y variables like this one. But today, we stick to a single explanatory response variable. So that was the, uh, the, the first thing that we can do. We may want to find the best equation and then use the parameters, the regression coefficients, to describe the effect of the different variables. We may want to use it for inference. That means general, generalizing the results of a set of, of observation to a target population, the reference population for which the, the data are a sample. And we, if it is a representative sample, then we can generalize our results to the <coughs> target population. Uh, and test some ecological hypothesis about the target population. It may simply concern the existence of a relationship. Do we have uh, uh, an R-square, for instance, different from zero? Or for a coefficient, is the slope of that coefficient different uh, from zero? In other instance, we can be concerned with the sign of the relationships. And we can also compute confidence intervals instead of doing tests of significance. That's another way of testing, uh, and so on. Sometimes the ecological hypothesis that we are entertaining specifies specific values of the parameters, and that's fine. We can test them in this framework. And the last objective is forecasting or prediction, which consists in calculating values of the response variable uh, for points where we don't have an observed value. So we may have observed value for 100 points, and in point number 101, we don't have an observed value. We can compute a regression uh, model uh, from the 100 points and then use that model and apply it to point number 101 in, in order to estimate a value. That's a way of doing imputation in the case of missing values and so on. Uh, <coughs> Professor Scardi mentioned this in his talk yesterday. So these are the main objectives. But uh, tomorrow, what we will do will be to use multiple regression, essentially, to compute the fitted values. Uh, <coughs> my next point is to mention that we can compute uh, the regression parameters using matrix algebra. I love algebra, and uh, uh, in discussions with uh, people uh, during the icebreaker yesterday, I realized that at least some of you like the algebra also. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about algebra. You will see it is not as bad as it sounds. So this is a typical uh, data set where we have a response variable and a bunch of explanatory variables here. Uh, so in, when we compute our regression equation, we want to estimate the B coefficients uh, that, when multiplying the X variables, will reproduce Y as well as possible within the framework of least squares uh, estimation. So usually, we want to estimate coefficients b1 to bm for the m variables. And also, we want to estimate the coefficient b0, which is the intercept 
as Professor Scardi mentioned yesterday. We are often interested in an intercept. Uh, and uh, this is done. We can estimate the intercept by adding a column of ones to the table with the m variable. So it is another variable that we add here. And it is a column of ones. And that is what allows us to estimate the intercept except in the rare cases where we want to force the origin to go through zero. And in that case, we don't include that column. When you do a multiple regression using the LM function of R, you don't have to include this column of one by end. It is included automatically by the LM function. So you don't do it yourself. It's included by LM. Now, when we have that, how can we solve this problem? We know y, we know x, but we don't know b. And so we have to isolate b in some way in order to compute something using x and y. But if it was simple algebra, we would divide y by x. But division does not exist in matrix algebra for good reasons. Uh, it is not uh, some imposition by mathematicians. It, conceptually, it cannot be done. OK, so what will we do instead? we will use a mathematics that implements the principle of least squares. So this is what we want to do. In order, instead of dividing y by x, we can multiply y by the inverse of x. Just like in ordinary algebra, if we have uh, 5 divided by 2, it is the same thing as 5 multiplied by 2 to the exponent minus 1, or 5 multiplied by 1 half, if you like. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, but in order to inverse x, to obtain that for an x matrix, that matrix has to be square. Oh, another constraint. So we will fabricate a square matrix as follows. We will pre-multiply by the transpose of x. We take the x matrix, transpose it, turn it like that, and pre-multiply here and there. So if this is true, then this is still true, because we have pre-multiplied by the same quantity. Now, this is a square matrix with the dimension of the number of columns. If we have m columns in x, then x prime x has the size m by m. And this can be inverted, because it is a square matrix. So we do that now. We invert this and pre-multiply it here and there. You see, this is the same bit as that. This is the same as that. So we simply add that here and there. And like in ordinary algebra, if you have a quantity multiplied by its inverse, these two cancel out, and they become one, or in this case, an identity matrix. So it disappears from the equation. And on the left, we are left with this. And we can isolate b. And this is how we solve uh, the uh, multiple regression problem. And we can compute all the b coefficients with one line of matrix algebra. Isn't that beautiful? I think this is great. And this is what we will be using tomorrow as the basis for canonical analysis. That's why it's important that I show you that today. Now, of course, we could also want to calculate the y hat, that is the fitted values. That will be produced by taking the original x matrix and multiplying it by these b coefficients that are estimates of uh, the original b's. And uh, if we replace b by this, we have x multiplied by b. And so it gives us this where we can compute y hat directly from, again, a single line of a matrix algebra. Uh, and actually, this is the equation that we will use today in canonical analysis, where small y will be replaced by large y. And we will obtain on this side a, a whole matrix of fitted values with one line of algebra, one line of R code. OK, so I hope I have convinced you that it is at least possible and this is something that you can try tonight uh, in your room if you uh, want to see how uh, regression can be computed.
it, it is really that simple. Uh, now I want to talk about R square and uh, this sort of things. And this is in uh, my chapter 10. There are a few pages from my chapter 10. Here it is. So I'll put it a bit bigger. <coughs> you have this document among the documents uh, that, that I put on the web page. Yeah, a bit bigger again. Yeah. So the first thing I want to show you is the R square. And then we will talk about adjusted R square. R square is the basic statistic that comes out of a regression equation. Actually, uh, I, found, I remember a paper where they were showing 12 different ways of calculating R square, all leading to the same result. Uh, when you have a regression equation, then from the regression equation with LM, you can produce then the fitted values y hat uh, using, for instance, the line of algebra that I showed before. So these are the fitted values. And the r square will be the sum of squares of the y hat divided by the total sum of squares that you had here. <coughs> so r square is sum of squares of the fitted values divided by the sum of squares of the original data. The sum of squares is simply you center the values, that is, divide, by, divide uh, uh, sub, subtract the mean, square the values, and sum them. That's all. And this is equal to if you were doing sum of squares of y hat, of y hat divided by n minus 1 here, and sum of squares of y divided by n minus 1. And this would be the variance of y hat divided by the variance of y. Okay. So we don't really need these n minus 1s. They cancel out. And it, it is more simple to write the equation in this way. But if you compute it with r, maybe you want to compute the variance of uh, y hat at the top and the variance of y at the bottom. It will produce the exact same r square. OK. So different ways of calculating. And essentially, if the y hats uh, are exactly equal to the y's, then your equation is uh, as a perfect success, and you predict the values perfectly. But otherwise, in all the real cases, the variance of the y hat is smaller than the variance of the y, because uh, in the regression equation, uh, your points are not exactly on the <coughs> on the regression line. If you have your regression line, your points will be all around it. And there are residuals left so that the variance of the y's, the original y's here, is larger than the variance of the y hat. So you obtain a coefficient that is between 0 and 1. 1 meaning total success, 0 meaning total failure. OK. Now, this seems to be a very good coefficient, but but, 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 uh, we also know from simple simulations that this is not the case. And here I'm going to show you simulation results in a paper by uh, Pedro Perez Neto, who has made strong contribution, and a guy named Daniel Barcar, and Stéphane Dre, and myself. Uh, but uh, all the simulation work was done by uh, Pedro who was then a postdoc in my lab. And I want to show you one picture of that paper on page 2617. This, the paper is available on our web page. This is the picture. We will look at the left panel here. For this study, uh, Pedro generated first two variables uh, with, uh, in columns with 100,000 uh, lines. And he <coughs> fiddled with his data so that there was a, a, a known correlation between the two data sets of 0.20 something or 0.60 something. 0.61. Okay. In one case it was 0.608 and the other case 0.201. So then he divided 
is 100,000 data into slices of 100 points. He had 1,000 slices. And for each slice, he computed a regression equation and uh, found an estimated R square, estimated by the regression, from a sample of the whole data set. Okay? And he repeated that 1,000 times. And he found that in the case of the points uh, with uh, points, point uh, 61 as a real R square, uh, he found this value. Now he started adding columns of random variables. This is easily generated in R uh, with the function R norm, random normal deviates. You ask for 100 R norm, and you put it here. Then you add two such columns, two, three, four, up to 20 such columns. So zero is the real values uh, for the real uh, pair of data, and then he adds columns into the X matrix here. So he adds essentially no information. There are random numbers. And look at the R square. It increases. For 100 points, if he has a total of 99 explanatory variables, so the real one plus 98 of these uh, phony random variables, he will reach an R square of 1. That is perfect fit. That's what we should do in ecology. We should add random variables and have high R square. That would be nice to publish in our papers. So we would have explained everything with nothing. You see, this is the danger of the R square. It overestimates the true relationship between y and x. And this is demonstrated with these simulations. And same thing here with the simulations w starting with a true value of 0.2, 20%. So the r square increases like that to reach 1 at the end. Now, back in uh, the year 1930, Ezekiel, not the prophet, but the statistician, Ezekiel then described is something well known as the adjusted R square. Aha, this is where it comes into the picture. The adjusted R square is <coughs> produced like this. You take your real R square coefficient of, t of determination, take one minus that, so the maximum minus that. This is called the coefficient of non determination in uh, <coughs> causal modeling. Now, you modify it by multiplying by total number of degrees of freedom, n minus 1, and residual degrees of freedom, which are, are n minus 1 minus number of explanatory variables. And when you have modified it like that, you turn it back into r square by taking 1 minus the, the result. And the adjusted r square are also shown in the simulations of Pedro here, Pedro Perez Neto, as the these lines here. And actually, this is the mean over the 1,000 simulations. And we see that the adjusted R square is very stable. So it does not respond to the number of non-explanatory variables. So that's very nice for us. This is a way of removing the effect of variables that, have, that are not pertinent in our analysis. So Daniel will uh, describe later ways of eliminating these variables by variable selection. But for a first approximation, especially in canonical analysis, we can simply leave all the variables there and compute the adjusted R square here. And the adjusted R square will be the basis for variation partitioning that uh, Daniel will describe before lunch. I'm almost done if you allow me if just a few more minutes. Uh, <coughs> So that was the story about the adjusted R square. In this uh, slide, uh, oh yes, and here in these simulations, actually the, the paper by Pedro was about the use of the adjusted R square as the basis for variation partitioning that Daniel will explain. And in this paper, he showed after these basic simulations that adjusted R square was the quantity to be used for variation partitioning because it is an unbiased estimate 
of the explained variation. That's, that's the story. Then in this handout, you also find uh, AIC, the Akaike Information Criterion, that belongs to the Bayesian thinking in statistics. We use it a lot for variable selection. And uh, when we, you will be using the function or the step, uh, I think in the, uh, the practicals this afternoon, perhaps, uh, or this step will be based on AIC, not this form, but this form here at the bottom, which is the corrected form for corrected for small sample. Okay, so AIC is very useful, and we the best predictive model is the one with the lowest value of AIC. So it is it is not at all like an R square where we look for the highest R square. Here we will look for the lowest AIC, and that produces. The, uh, that indicates the model when you are comparing different models, the one that has the best predictive power. Another important thing is the F statistic, but I will come back to the F statistic in multiple regression, and we will use it again tomorrow in canonical analysis. The F statistic is constructed from the, <coughs> from the R square, and it is simply in regression and in canonical analysis. It is simply R square divided by 1 minus R square. And here we divide by the number of explanatory variables. And here we divide by residual degrees of freedom that are like this. Okay? So this is the basis for testing a regression coefficient. And it will be also the basis tomorrow for testing uh, the relationship in canonical analysis. Exactly the same R square. Okay, I think that does it for this handout. And uh, yeah, the last thing is that I want to mention in multiple regression is uh, that uh, <coughs> I want you to remember, you probably have been told that, but sometimes we don't remember, that. Uh, <clears throat> of course, in the matrix X, we can put quantitative variables. But we can also put other things. And sometimes people forget about that. We get the impression that uh, multiple regression is meant only for quantitative variables. No. We can put binary variables. We can put factors, because if you give factors to the LM function, it will uh, recode them as a series of binary variables, as Daniela has shown you yesterday. It will be done automatically. Now, when it comes to geographic analysis, we can put different types of geographic information. Uh, <coughs> we can use the latitude and longitude information from the sampling points. We can use that as x and y here in the regression equation. But this is not very efficient. A uh, long time ago, we tried to develop the x and y geographic coordinates into polynomials. This is still useful uh, in some cases to model broad-scale spatial structures. But uh, it, it, it is not feasible to model fine-scale <coughs> spatial structures in that way. Now, sometimes our geographic information comes in the form of regions. We know that these points come from this region, these points from that other region. Regions can be represented by a factor, and they represent geographic information. And uh, finally, we will see, here I say in chapter 14, but on uh, Friday, we will describe these methods that uh, are the spatial eigenfunction derived from the geographic coordinates of the points, but that are much more efficient than the polynomial to model fine-scale geographic information. And we will use them as explanatory variables in regression or canonical analysis. So you see how things of this course will link to this idea of representing geographic information in the X matrix. So I stop here. Coffee for everyone.